Okay, thank you very much. Um, welcome back. Um, it doesn't seem like that long ago since we were here doing a welcome, and here we are in a final plenary session. But it's been a very active um, couple of days already, and the, the energy and enthusiasm, I hope, will not abate at this point in proceedings and will certainly extend uh, into the reception immediately after this session, I'm sure. Um, what we're going to do in this final session is uh, a series of things. Um, I'm delighted that we're going to be hearing from Wales' national poet, Gillian Clark, and I'll introduce Gillian in a moment or two. Gillian's going to speak or read for around 20, 25 minutes, and then there'll be the opportunity for some questions and discussion on the role of poetry um, as part of community identity and the construction uh, of uh, communities through poetry. Um, that will probably be about 20 minutes or so. And my colleague uh, from the HRC, Dr Alex Price, will be chairing uh, that part of the discussion. Um, after that, we're going to hear very briefly from Kerry and George with some immediate reflections uh, on the last uh, day and a half and, and give a perspective on maybe what happens next uh, with the Connected Communities programme following today. And then after that, we will allow you to go out and enjoy yourselves in that reception, uh, which we've promised. Um, but first of all, Gillian Clark. It is a great pleasure to introduce Gillian Clark to you this afternoon. It's not often in my job as Director of Research at the AHRC um, that I'm actually allowed to speak about my own uh, subject area um, with uh, favouritism or preference, um, but I am a Professor of English Literature. And I'm going to mention that at this point because in some respects, although Gillian's not aware of this, she may be responsible for my literary <laughs> critical um, career, which I'll come on to in a moment or two. Um, Gillian was born in this city in Cardiff and is a poet, playwright, editor and translator. She has written books for children, including translations from traditional Welsh stories, radio plays and is indeed uh, well known as a performer of her own poetry. And it's for those poetry collections, which include Snow on the Mountain, 1971, Letter from a Far Country, 1982, Letter in the Rumour, 1989, The King of Britain's Daughter, 1993, and more recently, A Recipe for Water, 2009, and Ice, 2012, that she is most known. She's also published uh, recently in 2008, a journal of the writer's year entitled At the Source. Gillian's work is intimately bound up with questions of borders, histories, landscapes, questions of tradition and the individual, be it the figure of the poet or the voices of women, inheritance or contemporary identity. Gillian's work draws on a diverse range of experience and a willingness to imagine the hospitality and the need to extend to other wisdoms, be they grand narratives or domesticity, collapsing the hierarchies between the two. That tradition is grounded in a perspective that she brings on Wales as a country and as an imagined identity. She has gone on record as saying, poetry is the national art of Wales. It is an unbroken ancient tradition. Her commitment to the craft of writing and indeed the community of writers led her to co-found in 1990 T. Newith, of which she is now president, a writer's centre in North Wales in the former house of the Welsh politician David Lloyd George. Gillian is also a freelance tutor of creative writing and has her work has been translated into 10 languages. She's travelled across Europe and the United States on lecture and poetry reading tours. She currently lives on a small holding in Ceredigion with a small flock of sheep and care for the land according to organic and conservation practice is core to her living ethics. Her recent awards have included the 2012 Wilfred Owen Association Poetry Award, the 2011, uh, in 2011, she was appointed a member of the Gorse of the Bards. In 2010, she won the Queen's Gold Medal for Poetry. And in 2008, she was appointed National Poet of Wales. Her dramatic piece for the National Theatre of Wales, The Gathering, will be performed on Snowdon in September of this year. Gillian's work is widely studied as part of the curriculum, both in Wales and indeed in the rest of the UK. And I first came to her poetry as a sixth form student in Swansea. When I, was asked, uh, when I was asked to introduce her today, I was truly pleased because I could actually remember very vividly um, one element uh, of the introduction that she made to her poems, which I'll touch on in a moment. But this uh, six, uh, six form anthology, Six Women Poets, many people in the room might recognise this, it's very much a set text. I think this version from 1990 is already the fifth uh, impression. 
But it's very important because it actually gave me the opportunity to reflect on how Gillian's poetry has impacted on my study of literature. Going back to this volume of poems and looking at my horrific handwriting, um, but also to see the prototype of the literary critic in uh, the comments I made on her poetry, which I would be ashamed to share with her at this point, but nevertheless meant something to me at the time. But what was really important was as soon as I knew that I'd be introducing Gillian, I remembered something about the introduction to that collection of poems um, that she had in this volume. And it's very true and relevant to the Connected Communities Festival today. What she says there, and it's annotated in both pen and pencil to prove how important uh, that particular comment is. But what she said is, the poet is the voice of the tribe with responsibilities to language and to people. And poetry's purpose is to give words to all human experience and thus to share it. And I can't think of anything that's more relevant to some of the discussion we'll have today about the written word, poetry and community. Please join me in welcoming Wales' national poet, Gillian Clark. Oh, what an introduction. I all, halfway through I thought, Who's he talking about? <laughs> um, I asked for a lectern, and I, what I've got is a pulpit. Um, very appropriate, I come from a long line of Welsh Baptist ministers. Um, right, I've, when um, Alex told me that, uh, asked me to come, and then said, and could you, bring a, could you write a poem? I have written a poem for this occasion, especially. Um, finished really this morning. What I mean is I wrote it, like say, 24 hours ago, but then you tweak, then you tweak, then you tweak. So this morning is the absolute final print of it. And probably that won't be the final one either, but I have brought it. Um, but what really bemused me and kept me awake for several nights as I was preparing for this is that Connected communities is a very, very abstract idea. And I don't write about the abstract world, I write about sheep, <laughs> people, um, humans, human people, uh, the earth, uh, trees. Um, so I had to, th when, when the sort of de the description of what you're going to be up to over these few days came through, then I understood. Then I thought, oh, I see archaeology, history, industry, okay, I can do that, because there aren't very many of those things that I haven't um, put my mind to and put my pen to at some time or other. So what I've, what I've done is chosen maybe seven, we'll see if we've got time for them, seven poems, which all I feel are the poet telling the world about something that the world wouldn't otherwise know about. And I'm starting with a poem that you probably know then, because I'm going to, and I don't read this very often. It's a very quite an old poem. It's a poem called Miracle on St. David's Day, and you've no doubt known. One. Right, Miracle on St. David's Day describes an incident that uh, happened in Abergavenny Mental Hospital when the, um, they asked me to come into the um, therapy um, department to talk about, um, to read poems to those patients in the hospital who were capable of listening to poems. And um, this is a true story, and I kept telling everybody the story, and they said, stop talking about it, write it. But here it is. And it was on St. David's Day, a beautiful early St. David, early spring with daffodils everywhere. And um, I have a quote under the title, which is from The Daffodils by William Wordsworth. Miracle on St. David's Day. They flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, from Daffodils, Wordsworth. An afternoon yellow and open-mouthed with daffodils, the sun treads the path among cedars and enormous oaks. It might be a country house, guests strolling, the rumps of gardeners between nursery shrubs. I am reading poetry to the insane. An old woman interrupting offers as many buckets of coal as I need. A beautiful chestnut-haired boy listens, entirely absorbed. A schizophrenic on a good day, he'll, they tell me later. In a cage of first March sun, a woman sits, not listening, 
not seeing, not feeling. In her neat clothes, the woman is absent. A big, mild man is tenderly led to his chair. He has never spoken. His laborer's hands on his knees. He rocks gently to the rhythms of the poems. I read to their presences, absences, to the big, dumb, laboring man as he rocks. He is suddenly standing silently, huge and mild, but I feel afraid. Like slow movement of spring water, or the first bird of the year in the breaking darkness, the laborer's voice recites the daffodils. The nurses are frozen, alert. The patients seem to listen. He is hoarse, but word perfect. Outside, the daffodils are still as wax. A thousand, ten thousand, their syllables unspoken, their creams and yellows still. Forty years ago, in a valley's school, the class recited poetry by rote. Since the dumbness of misery fell, he has remembered there was a music of speech, and that once he had something to say. When he's done, before the applause, we observe the flowers' silence. A thrush sings, and the daffodils are flame. Now, there are two poems I'm going to read now um, that fit before the one I've written for you. And one of them, uh, they're both studied, the point is they're both studied widely for GCSE exams. The English exam is taken all over the world. So I get emails every single week of my life, and I'm the only one of the poets on the syllabus who replies at all, and I reply to every single one. And they come in from Kuwait, South America, France, Africa, Asia. It's extraordinary. And I think it's a kind of miracle all by itself that a poem and the GCSE, Till Gove has his way, of course. <laughs> Till Gove get, wants, to get, wants to get rid of us, us modern ones. Um, it, while we're on it, it means that we are speaking across nations. So this is a particularly uh, useful little connection given the, the subject of your um, conference. And the first one I'm going to read is called Lament. It's in here. This is about the first Gulf War. And if you remember, Iraq invaded Kuwait. America, because of the oil, was in straight away with flying in to bomb it. Britain joined in, and before we knew it, we were on the brink of something huge and, and, and terrible. I, I heard a lot of, um, it was before really we'd had one of the big wars of recent years, so it was a very big shock to all those lads who joined up because they didn't have anything else to do, because they didn't have jobs, they joined the army. And I remember hearing a woman on the radio saying, my boys only were in it for the music, and both her boys had been sent um, straight, straight out to Kuwait. And the, in the newspapers, there were some terrible photographic images, and one of them was a tank which had been burnt, and there was just the burnt body of a soldier trying to get out of it with his fist in the air. Terrible, terrible picture, never to be forgotten. And others were cormorants covered with oil and other creatures uh, because, of course, they set fire to the oil wells. It, the oil flowed all over the sea. And not only human beings, but the natural world was totally about to be destroyed by, by this war. So my lament, and I'm thinking about the, the trumpet, you know, the, the music. My lament is trying not to take sides. Lament for the green turtle with her pulsing burden. 
in search of the breeding ground, for her eggs laid in their nest of sickness, for the cormorant in his funeral silk, the veil of iridescence on the sand, the shadow on the sea, for the ocean's lap with its mortal stain, for Ahmed at the closed border, for the soldier in his uniform of fire, for the gunsmith and the armorer, the boy fusilier who joined for the company, the farmer's sons in it for the music, for the hook-beaked turtles, the dugong and the dolphin, the whale struck dumb by the missile's thunder, for the tern, the gull and the restless wader, the long migrations and the slow dying, the veiled sun and the stink of anger, for the burnt earth and the sun put out, the scalded ocean and the blazing well, for vengeance and the ashes of language. The first thing to go is the truth, of course. We're all lied to immediately about what's going on. Um, now, the next poem um, is one that is studied widely, and I frequently do get uh, message, um, questions and messages from the Middle East about it, but other places as well. Now, here's another one which has been on the GCSE, in it, it, actually in a set anthology, for a long time. I think, and it's still being stu studied because I keep getting questions to this day about it. It's very, very difficult to imagine this poem being studied in Africa and Asia and places like that because it's so very specifically Keradigion, countryside. We're cutting a field, field of hay. It's very beautiful weather. Hot, hot, gorgeous June weather, like now. And my grandchildren, our grandchildren are staying with us, and one of them is four at the time. Now, this is in the 90s, because it's the time when um, hundreds of Muslim men were, were taken and murdered and thrown into pits in Bosnia. And we've, 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 got, we've got the perpetrator of that terrible crime and waiting for some sort of rather lengthy trial going on. But it was a terrible thing, and we didn't quite know what had happened. We knew something terrible had happened. And it seemed so awful at the time that there was a war in Europe. And I lived in Europe, and Keradigion was in Europe, and the summer was the same, and the hay was the same, and the sky. And yet just not very far away um, was this terrible thing happening. Now, I, it's a Sunday. Haymaking is lovely and fun. And I was trying not to think about the world. And I didn't want to read the Sunday papers. I just didn't want to know what was going on. I just wanted to be happy with my grandchildren and the hay and the fun. Um, this little grandson, who was, who was four then, loved animals so much he would rescue green fly. He'd bring a little green fly on his finger and place it carefully somewhere. And he found an injured mouse, a field mouse, in the, in the, the machines had gone over and um, ran with it to me to say, save it, save it. The field mouse. Summer and the long grass is a snare drum. The air hums with jets down at the end of the meadow far from the radio's terrible news. We cut the hay. All afternoon its wave breaks before the tractor blade. Over the hedge, our neighbour travels his field in a cloud of lime, drifting our land with a chance gift of sweetness. The child comes running through the killed flowers, his hands a nest of quivering mouse, its black eyes, two sparks burning. We know it'll die and ought to finish it off. It curls in agony big as itself, and the star goes out in its eye. Summer in Europe. The fields hurt, and the children kneel in long grass, staring at what we have crushed. Before day is done, the field lies bleeding, the dusk garden inhabited by the saved, voles, frogs, a nest of mice, the wrong that woke from a rumour of pain won't heal and we can't face the newspapers. 
All night, I dream the children dance in grass, their bones brittle as mouse ribs, the air stammering with gunfire. My neighbor turned stranger, wounding my land with stones. And then, I wrote one for you. It refers to the last two poems in a way, especially the last one. So I went rummaging through my email um, archive for the name Yasmin and for, for another name, Emmanuel. Yasmin is a teacher, Emmanuel is, is a lovely, a lovely boy. And I had communicated with both in very different ways as they asked me questions. Messengers. A sound. One shining droplet falling in water. And a message arrives on my screen from God knows where. A single high note from the scream of swallows swirling the sky. Or the thud of a bird against glass. A ping like a harp string breaking on a warm evening. And it's you, Yasmin, teacher, from your English class, Mianwali, Pakistan. Your girls' questions, my answers, their pity for the hurt field mouse in the poem they study, fly between us in the one human room of the world. Or you, Emmanuel, in your broken African boy talk, text speaking to me from your class in Accra, Nigeria. Help me, you say. You in your class of 60, your hand raised to your teacher's praising surprise. Your question, my answer, migrate the sky's blue road, like the swallows who bring me African dust on their wings and the lightnings of Asia as they turn in blades of sunlight this warm Atlantic morning. I want to tell you what Emmanuel's... Well, I'll tell you that what happened at the end of my correspondence with Yasmin. Very last exchange. Oh, my son recorded me reading the poem and sent it to her, so it became quite a long, complicated and delightful. Uh, I would love to meet her. I feel we're friends. And eventually, she sent me an amazing letter from them all, which ended, I could teach them peace through your poems. Love, Yasmin, and my class. And peace, Pakistan. As it just shows how probably among the disorder in some of these countries, there are such peace-loving, civilized, wonderful human beings doing their damn best for, for the few people they have contact with. And I think she's wonderful. Uh, I must write to her again, indeed. Um, and as for Emmanuel, the first message that came through said, um, hello, I got put hand up in lit class. It's because of you. I never put hand up in lit class. Thanks. <laughs> T-H-A with an X. So I wrote back. And I thought, you know, he's so, he's such a real teenager, and yet he's, he's in a cra. And um, I wrote back to him, and I said, um, well, in my opinion, you could put your hand up in lit class a, a lot more often. And I hope you will, because you are obviously cleverer than you thought you were. <laughs> a week later, a message comes through saying, help. I have this question. Does the poet, brackets, that's you? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And um, I sent him a, I thought, I, I'm guessing at the 60 in the class, but it's likely, it's likely. And it's also, it's, you know, they struggle. You know, we're so lucky, we're so damn lucky. Um, and, and yet this beautiful boy, despite everything, was just wanted, wanted to do well. So I sent him, not just telling him what to say, I sent him a sort of little, les little lesson. Ask yourself this, ask yourself this, ask yourself this, so that, so that he'd learn from it. Um, and then he did say, thank you, he got a good mark. So <laughs> I'm very, very happy to have, I feel he's my friend too. And that's just one of many, many, many. Um, 
Bach at St. David's. I'm, I'm now connecting with music, um, which is in here. Um, I, heard, I heard the Monteverdi Choir playing a Bach Mass at St. David's Cathedral, uh, which is a most wonderful cathedral, on a summer's day. And um, uh, what I learned on that day, my husband's an architect, what I learned on that day is that music is, sounds the way it does because of the architecture. Like, in fact, apart from the microphone, this room, you wouldn't be able to hear me because of the low ceiling of the white, you know, it would all be rather, rather tricky. Um, so a building, a building shapes sound. And I think that's so beautiful. I love the idea that the cathedral itself made the music and the music made the cathedral. To me, that's connecting communities. I hope you agree. <laughs> Bach at St. David's in spring. Fifteen centuries ago, the age of saints and stones and holy wells, a blackbird sang its oratorio in the fan-vaulted canopy of the trees. Before Bach, before walls, before bells, cantatas, choirs, cloisters, clear stories, the audience holds its breath when the soprano, like a bird in the forest long ago, sings the great cathedral into being and apps to nave it calls back, echoing, till orchestra and choir in harmony break on the stones like the sea. And listen, out there, at the edge of spring among the trees, a blackbird answering. Six Bells was a terrible um, mining accident that happened in in June, on the 28th of June, 1960, 44 miners were killed in the explosion um, in, in Gwent. My, de my late father-in-law was the captain of the mines rescue team in that area, so my husband remembers great sorrow and anxiety in the house at the time of this accident. The BBC asked me to write this, so I'm thinking, it's poetry connecting with the BBC, connecting with, with mining, and connecting with, the, with South Wales memory. I hope you agree. So six bells for the 44 miners killed in the explosion on the 28th of June, 1960, and I thought about just one woman, and I found out what kind of a day it was on the day of the accident. It was a beautiful day. Six bells. Perhaps a woman hanging out the wash paused, hearing something, a sudden hush, a pulse inside the earth like a blow to the heart, holding in her arms the wet weight of her wedding sheets, his shirts. Perhaps heads lifted from the work of scrubbing steps, hands stilled from ringing rainbows onto slate, while below the town, deep in the pit, a rockfall stuck a spark from steel and fired the void, punched through the mine a fist of blazing fire damp. As they died, perhaps a silence, before sirens cried, before the people gathered in the streets, before she'd finished hanging out her sheets. Um, this is for painting. There's a very well-known poet in Wales called Shani Rhys James. And she said that if I wrote her a poem about one of the pictures in an exhibition, she'd paint me a picture. Well, my poem, you know, <laughs> I could write a shopping list on it. It's not worth anything. Um, her paintings, <laughs> it was a good swap. <laughs> her painting was about oppressive wallpaper um, in London when she lived with her mother um, in Diggs. Her mother was an actress. And they lived in with terrible wallpaper. And um, so she, I, I don't live with wallpaper at all. You don't have wallpaper, just have paint. Um, but we have lots of flowers. And there were tremendous... I, we came back hot on a hot night, opened the door, and inside there was a, a bunch of lilies, and that gave me my starting point for Shani's poem. And by the way, once, when I gave it to her, she then wrote, uh, did another painting, and she did a painting before getting the poem, and then she did another one about this poem. So it's, all, it's going on and on. White lilies, 
The lilies yawn like leopards caged all day in the hot house. Back late, we open the door and an animal breath flows out, filling the night garden, bittersweet with azalea and cat breath of flowers. Inside, paw prints of pollens, the colour of blood, soft blood beads to stain the fingers, a petal curled like a cat on the scratched piano, scent escaped like a gas. I inhale it, dizzy, losing myself in thickets of frond, fern, leaf, stems and stamens of roses, wallpaper flowers climbing the walls of the yellow room, red room, blue room, in the stink of nectar and damp. They grow over the windows, the doors, till I'm spellbound in the story of a girl woman tamed and trapped in a tower, in a wood, in a thicket of flowers where something is breathing, is purring, is prowling. And finally, a sad story. The little girl lost and never found, obviously murdered in some appalling way, in the Huntleth. Um, this poem, they didn't ask me to write it, no one asked me to write it, and I kept it, I just suddenly could not, not write it. Eventually I sent it to the vicar, because I thought she'd know what to do that was sensitive. In, in fact, they printed it out, and the little girl April, her favorite color was pink, bit obvious, but there you go. Um, and they printed the poem out in pink and handed it out to all the parishioners. This was before she was found. Daughter. A pearl, April. Born of water. Born now in the river's arms. Child of the mountain. Mermaid of the estuary. Everyone's daughter. Let her not be lost to the mothering sea. Let her be light on the wave. Let her change us forever. Let us see her sweet face whenever we gaze on the river, the sea, like the moon on water. Let this pain that is sleepless lighten to love, to kindness. Let ours be the arms that caught her, love's weight, her light the lightness of everyone's daughter. I pause there. By the way, I have a huge admiration for the community of Machantleth, which didn't bang on the van when they caught the, the guy, who were dignified at the sides of the streets, who every single one of them walked up mountains and went down mines looking for her and cooked for everybody. It was the most amazingly beautiful, beautiful example of a whole town, a whole community pulling together. And I have such, I would be so proud. I, I live about 40 miles south of, of Machantleth, but I would be proud <laughs> to be a person from Machantleth. I'm proud to be from Keredigion because they, that's how they behaved. Anyway, thank you very much. for um, that wonderfully spellbinding reading. Um, you really got to the heart of some of the um, difficult and, and, um, and wonderful aspects of community, whether that's local or, or worldwide. Um, Jillian's very kindly agreed um, to kind of um, engage in a bit of Q&A, but I was hoping it might be a discussion as well about some of the um, overall themes that the projects he represented here explore, and um, some of the questions and ideas about the way that um, the arts and humanities are interacting with, um, with communities. Um, so I hope that um, we can, we can bring all of those things together um, in our conversations. Um, and I might open with um, my sort of chair's prerogative um, and begin by asking Gillian um, what, what you kind of really see as um, the role of um, communities through your life and, and what, how that has informed your work um, for, the, for the better and, and sometimes whether that might actually prove difficult at times as well. <laughs> oh gosh, that's really a big question because when you go, uh, the role of, and I thought you were, you were going to say national poet, and you say, Commu yeah. 
in community, oh my God. Um, well, all I can say is that um, it's, that's, a re- that's, that's kind of an abstract question in a way. But I used to be an academic. <laughs> first of all, I'm, I'm from Cardiff and love this city. And f- every time I come here, uh, if I get in a taxi, I, I'm absolutely thrilled with how, how very Cardiffian Cardiffians are. <laughs> and I feel very connected with them. Um, so that's a first, first, that's an old community. Um, I live in Ceredigion in West Wales where my farming family ancestors come from. And I've been there for 30 years. I, I also live in Cardiff. I mean, I've got a flat in Cardiff as well. I love this city. Um, and I, I believe it's, um, I do believe it's my duty to talk to taxi, taxi drivers. I do believe it's our, to, our, our duty to talk to each other, to communicate you know, to cross barriers. And so uh, I think I'm going to go to the national poet thing. In my role as national poet, I decided there are all sorts of barriers and I have to get across them. And one of them is English-Welsh. And I don't mean racially, I mean the language. Racial is neither here nor there. The language. I was determined that I was going to be um, as often in Welsh language schools as in English language schools and, and I was going to get get all my official poems translated into Welsh and so on, and like, that has happened. There's north and south. We've got a great big mountains in the middle and no road. <laughs> There's nothing you, that England would call a road between Cardiff and... So, um, and very, you know, we have to go into England to go to North Wales, really. Um, and so I, I thought, well, to hell with that. I'm just going to get out there and, and, and make sure I go accept all the inv- invitations to North Wales and everywhere else as well. Then there's Wales, England, and I thought, I'm going to go into England and shout about Wales. Two things. I, my, I had a mission. Poetry and Wales. It's a little country, but it's, you know, it's, it's, neither, it's not better or worse than other countries, but it's my country, and so I've got things to... And the fact is that Wales is the... It, it, the, 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 the first language of the islands of Britain was Welsh. And the uh, earliest poetry, the earliest known named poets, Taliesin and Anairin, wrote in the 6th century, not in the geographical area of Wales. They wrote one in, in Scotland, in the north. But the language is Welsh, and we are the, um, we are the safe keepers of that early, early history. But nobody in England, no English child, is ever taught about these things. They're not told. It's, jo- it's all about... What? It's all about 1066 and we conquered. And then the empire. And excuse me, there is a very interesting early history that, that needs to be uh, acknowledged. Don't so look at I, me, I'm Irish. <laughs> yeah, well, you, 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 you know, you, you know more than English people do, probably. Yeah. And then, then there was the Celtic connection. I thought, I'm going to go to Ireland, I'm going to go to Scotland, if they ask me. And they did, and I went. And, and then I thought, and I've got to get across across to other countries, and so every time I had a horrible long flight to do, I said, yes, I'll do it, um, and so on. Uh, and I, I felt really that it was an ab- ambassadorial role. And the way my s- heroes in rugby can score tries for me and on my behalf, I can't do that, but I can write poems. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'd like to open it up to the floor, and I think there should be a roving microphone somewhere. Um, um, thank you very much for that. That was very nice and very touching. And um, it's been very useful for me to be here, being an academic, and meeting all these amazing people who are in their own way doing different kind of work. And in my own work, I'm very interested in um, attachment, attachment disorders, and I look at attachment wounds. And I feel very much a theme of this conference has been really about talking about attachment wounds and how the arts and the humanities um, can become a way, if you like, to make communities connected again. So I think, um, you know, some of the emphasis has been on by, about history, about, if you like, almost archiving this past and resuscitating it for, to, like, renew those attachments. And some of it has been about identity as well. But I've been thinking a lot about what happens when we move beyond those things and we start to build new kinds of attachments between people in new kinds of ways that are very much based on the here and now and, and, you know, what people are really experiencing in the here and now. So, just some ideas, really. Yeah. (coughs) 
Okay, so I suppose um, the question, I guess, behind that is whether community is just about um, a kind of a restorative or um, a restorative kind of historical view, or whether you think that community still has this relevance in um, in the modern day, and whether there's um, there's something. I guess that came out in your poems with the, the use of the internet and how um, how the contemporary community yeah. is actually so much more than just the local. Um, it is local, but it's also so much more than that. I'm no expert. <laughs> I'm quite a good. I'm quite an expert at communicating. But um, well, I think the the examples are the behaviour of, of Machatlet in this modern day, actually getting getting out and looking for the child, and the internet. The, you know, these are two extreme versions of. But they're both. Aren't we lucky to have both? Aren't we lucky to have towns which really care about each other and get, get out and do something. Um, but I think that the internet is quite wonderful. I, 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 have, I, had a, I had a message from France. I wrote a poem called Oradour. Does anybody know about the terrible thing that happened at Oradour sur Clan near Limoges in France? Right, a few days after D-Day, the SS in charge of that village near Limoges um, put all the men in barns, waited for the workers to come home from Limoges on the train, took them to the barns, put all the women in the church and killed them all uh, by shooting ra at random and then firing the buildings. Um, three people escaped. One is Robert Hebras. I've heard from him. I've heard from him because I wrote a poem about Orador. And he's now in his 80s and he goes around schools talking about peace. It's a perfect example about, of a human being in, you know, who had every reason to, to live a life of bitterness and hate. He was 16 years old when, when that happened to him. And he hasn't done that. He's gone around talking peace in schools. And then an Eng a Welsh friend of his, in other words, an English-speaking Welshman, um, uh, f um, found my poem on the internet, translated it and gave it to him, and now there's that communication as well. So what we have there is history. A good guy, a really good man who overcame everything to, do, to try and improve things in this awful world. And again, the internet. It's, it, I was thrilled to bits to get that message. Thrilled. Okay, and we have a question here. Thanks. That was so, so beautiful to hear the readings. Thank you so much for that performance. It was fantastic. And I really wanted to clap in between, but it didn't seem right. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I've got this, this thing. I'm trying to think about how it is that you as a poet focus on, like you said, the individual or the specific and the detail of a person or a life or a moment or something, which is really specific. And that's how you go in and find something. Then through your poetry, with words, which I think probably most of us would agree has come up through this conference as one of the things that words may often make communi connect, community connections hard because words get in the way, but your work somehow manages to take something specific to a specific community and create something which can then jump across such huge barriers that we, we, I don't understand, I'm trying to work out how it happens. I mean, it's not the first time, you know, it's not, it's not a new idea, but it's just so well crystallised, especially when you talk about the, the communication that comes back to you from the places it comes from, and there's something that we need to learn from you, and I don't know whether you have an insight about what that might be, how we can, how your working with words is so effective, and our working with words so often is ineffective or something. Um, uh you, you summed it up perfectly. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you, you could come and teach for us at Tinewith. <laughs> at Tinewith, where we, we run classes week in, week out throughout the whole year for schools, um, 16 to 18 year olds, plus adults and, of any, and people of any, any age. The key thing is be specific. All, whether it's poetry or, or the novel, or all the best novels. Uh, all modern novels that are really, really appeal to us. We're, we're reading them and thinking, yes, it's like that. That's so, that's so right. Those words say how I feel, how, what I saw. So, I mean, what the writer must do is tell the absolute truth. Fact, look. It, um, some poet or other, I've forgotten, forgotten who it is, said, 
poetry is in things. True, absolutely true. And you've just said so. And um, yeah, <laughs> oh, I think all, all good contemporary poets are writing in the way you describe, every one of them. They're all writing about real things. And even if it sounds like fantasy, it's filled with real things. It's filled, it's filled with the colours, the touch, the smell that you know, that you recognise as a fellow human being. So it pre might pretend to be fantasy, but it isn't. It's experience. And that experience, if the reader feels, this writer is writing just for me, because you do feel that, don't you, sometimes? Oh, my God, this is my book. And... Um, and that's because the writer's doing a damn good job at being a human being and telling you about it. And you've just summed it up perfectly. <laughs> you don't okay. need any advice. Um, I would love to take more questions, but um, I'm aware that um, you have a reception to get to and that some of you may also be getting trained, so I'm oh, really keen that, that, we, that we keep the time. We don't want anyone missing, missing their train. Um, so I'd like us to thank um, Gillian again for taking the time to speak to us. OK, I'm conscious that I'm straight after the National Poet of Wales, and just before there's a reception outside, so I'll keep it short. I talked yesterday morning, was it only that short time ago, about the idea of festival, the idea of this event being a festival. And don't you think that that's what we've had, made, a bit or quite a lot, a festival? Everyone I've spoken with about it has commented on the buzz and energy that's here, of ideas, practices, the pleasure of sharing, whether it's discourse or fresh baked bread? And are they so different in connected communities? The sun and the water, elemental features of festal desire have made their contribution in this wonderful location too. If I take just one creative example to talk about for a moment, I hope that doesn't feel limiting or reductive for the breadth and depth of events overall. There's been a lot of live music at this event um, as Gillian talked about, you know, in this context of music and architecture, music resounds space, inescapably, in fact. Wasn't it Adorno, was it? I always say it was, who said, you can't close your ears. So uh, yesterday I went to see a school children's choir singing about the Merthyr riots of 1831 in the public sphere of the Millennium Centre. Last night we had Rafiki Jazz, a kind of global utopia on stage, singing songs of rights, a sonic outer nationalism from Yorkshire. This morning we had the full English. What a band. And uh, with, uh, you know, exploring tradition, archive research, English style, marvellously. And tonight, for those who are going downtown to the downtown Cardiff Music Club, the self-organisation of the DIY bands. These musics are researched too in their different ways and through performance. Local history for primary schools, tomorrow's university students, we hope. International identities and heritages, the creative use of archive, exploring the cultural politics of autonomy. The choir or band is a cultural community too, itself, and the sound connects with the audience, enlarging, Developing, echoing, clashing. We've made the festival together. That is, we've co-produced it. 40 years ago, said Gillian in her first poem. Well, that was nearly when Glastonbury started. With David Bowie and Free Milk. That was Free Milk, not a band called Free Milk. <laughs> is this a sign for this festival? Thanks, Jim. Ah, lights. God, lucky me to come after two people who have such ways with words. Um, I want to just reflect on some words I heard this morning um, from the performing Abergavenny team, who said, community is a verb, not a noun. It's produced through repeated acts of micro-sociality. So community is, not, is a verb, not a noun. It's a process. It's a thing that is in production. It's something that is being made. And I think the Connected Community Festival itself has been an act of producing a new community, an act of small acts of sociability. Um, 
and it's been an amazing community. I was at one session yesterday that included people working with woodland, with prisons, with heritage, with sports, military history, the first Wikipedia town, architecture, protest, farming, and intergenerational relationships. One session. Um, I've had conversations about death and immortality, the role of the digital and the physical, how to get institutions to change, folk music, the difficulties and precarities of being an early career researcher, and the number of young people taking on jobs today on less than the minimum wage. So what astonishes me in this festival as compared to some of the previous events is that it feels like it has been about humans coming together, not community partners and academics, but actually about people coming together and having good, hard conversations. We are still critically reflecting on this process of coming together. We're not pretending that it's easy. Uh, if it was easy, it probably wouldn't be worth doing. So I think what this festival, I hope, has done is gone some way to building those small acts of sociality that are about us being in common and for me I take away from that a basis for optimism a sense of common humanity a sense of shared endeavor that is hugely needed today we were asked to think about what next and I've taken away a to-do list of things for the program but I think the what next is not really about the AHRC program it's all about what we do ourselves and I think if what we can do is think about the next small act the next small step to create those relationships then I think we've done something good thank you Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Um, thank you to Kerry and George. Um, thank you to Gillian. Also, thank you to Jeff uh, Cuthbert, the Assembly member who spoke uh, yesterday morning. I'm going to forget to mention somebody I know I am, so <laughs> please bear with me on this. But really, this is about a thank you to all of you, all the participants, all the communities, all the project teams, all the individuals who've come together for this festival, everyone who contributed to the exhibits, to the um, displays, to the films, to all the activities that have taken Taken place over this period, including performers, speakers, workshop leaders, delegates, participants, the 693 people who had name badges, plus all the others who might have wandered in from the streets of Cardiff over the last couple of days. I include amongst those also the early career researchers that we've touched on um, a couple of times who I know is staying uh, into tomorrow's session as well. A big thank you from the HRC and from me in particular to all our student volunteers who've been there to shepherd people on and off buses. Um, sometimes the right buses, sometimes the wrong buses, but that's another story and I'll have to pick up the tab for that at a later point. But thank you very much for getting involved with this process. Um, key to this has been Kerry and George and their involvement in helping to shape what this festival could be that made it different from a showcase or a summit and I think we've done that and uh, Kerry and George have both reflect on that a bit as well. Um, also uh, a huge thank you to all the staff from the HRC. We have 49 staff in programmes and I think most of them have been here at one point uh, yesterday or today so I'm not going to be able to name all of them but a very big thank you to the team that's responsible for connected communities but also all the teams that have joined in um, as well including Phil Pothan and his comms team, his communications team in particular, for the support they've provided. Um, I'm also going to say on behalf of all AHRC colleagues, a big thank you to someone who's remained relatively quiet at uh, this uh, uh, event, um, but that's Gary Grubb, my associate director, who's all of you involved with Connected Communities will know that this uh, has depended a huge amount on Gary driving forward the programme within the research councils. Um, and although he's been very quiet at this, he has definitely been uh, popping up at various events. He's taken his tie off, which means he's in a very relaxed mood uh, for today's event. I was shocked when I arrived earlier on and discovered he was tireless. I said, you're letting the fund inside, don't you? But, um, but Gary deserves a tremendous amount of thanks for, for driving forward the activities behind this event and supporting the HRC staff to, to achieve this. Most importantly, though, as well amongst all of this, is to thank Cardiff, actually, to thank the hospitality of the city. It's been great to have um, people from the city of Cardiff uh, come along to the events, including some bread making yesterday, but also um, just to have the wonderful experience of being uh, here for uh, the last couple of days. I'm now going to let you loose on the reception. I have no idea what's on the reception. I hope there's some form of um, alcoholic <laughs> provision there to reward you all for that. But the reception is taking place out there. In the meantime, thank you to everybody. Um, Dio